Hi, my name is Bill Kinney. I'm a math professor at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. In this video, you can see I'm going to, going to be going through an, a sample AP Calculus AB exam for you, section one, part A. It's a no calculator portion to that exam. It's 30 questions. The, your goal is to solve all 30 problems within 60 minutes. I'm going to give some explanations, so I'm going to go slower to explain how to do things as I go. It's probably going to take me a couple hours to go through this. Um, and you'll probably want to approach this in such a way that you are pausing the video to try the problems on your own before you watch me solve them, just to confirm that you got the right answer and also to get any insight that might be helpful for the AP exam. I've got plenty of other videos on math here at my channel, Bill Kinney Math, uh, including lectures on Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, a lot of applications of calculus, including applications to financial math if you want to be an actuary. I've got a lot of videos about that. I also have a blog called infinityisreallybig.com where I get into a lot of details as well. But let's go ahead and work through this exam. It's again a no calculator portion. So you want to be able to do these definitely without a calculator. You want to memorize some formulas. That is necessary to do. But you also want to understand things. Let's look at the first problem. We've got a cubic function. f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. What is the goal? The goal is to find an equation of the tangent line to the graph of this function at x equals 3. I think it's a good idea to be experienced enough with, for example, polynomial functions to draw a quick sketch of what's going on before you actually solve the problem. This is a cubic, so that's going to mean the end behavior as x goes to plus infinity or minus infinity is going to be going up over here and down over here. The coefficient of x cubed is positive. I also see the vertical intercept is 1. I see that I've got no linear term, so the slope at x equals 0 would be 0. You've got a quadratic term with a negative coefficient. Initially, when x is close to 0, that is going to mean the graph is going to be concave down. Will it cross the x-axis over here or not? It's hard to say. It may or may not, but for sure it's going to come back up. And my guess is by the time you get to x equals 3, probably that you're on the uh, upward path here. And so the tangent line looks like it's going to have a positive slope and a negative vertical intercept. That allows us to rule out choices uh, A and D, likely at least, right away. Probably it's going to either be B or C. That's got a positive slope, the coefficient of x is positive, and a negative vertical intercept. The general equation for the tangent line is something you should memorize. Y equals f of A plus f prime of a times x minus a. It does make sense if you think about it carefully. For example, when x equals a, think of a as a fixed number here. You'll plug in x equals a right there. You'll get a minus a is 0. f prime of a times 0 is 0. You get an output of f of a, that number f of a. It's got the right, it goes to the right point, a comma f of a. It also has the right slope. Again, it's a function of x. It's a linear function of x. There's your first power of x. The slope is the coefficient. If you distribute the f prime through of a through the parentheses, it will be the coefficient of x. It is the slope. The derivative does give you the slope. What is a here? a is 3. That's the value of x here. They don't say it equals a, but that's what it equals. Okay, That's the point that you're thinking about. So now you just have to plug the numbers in. So we want to find f of a, which is f of 3. Plug in 3 into the function. Again, this is a no calculator portion, so you need to be good enough with your um, mental arithmetic to be able to handle this. 3 cubed is 27 times 2 is 54. Minus 3 times 3 squared is minus another 27. Plus 1. 54 minus 27 is 27. Plus 1 is 28. What is f prime of 3? Well, we need the derivative of f first. It's a polynomial. The derivative of a sum and difference of things is the corresponding sum or difference of the derivatives. And we have the power rule here as well. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Bring the 3 down in the front and subtract 1 from the exponent, but you also need to multiply by 2. So you get a 6x squared for the derivative of 2x cubed. Minus the derivative of 3x squared is minus 6x. Bring down that 2 right there. 2 times 3 is 6. Subtract 1 from this exponent to get a 1. And of course, the derivative of 1 is 0. So there's f prime of x. Now plug in 3. 3 squared is 9. 9 times 6 is 54. Then you have 6 times 3 is 18. So we have 54 minus 18. And that will be 36. And so you can write the tangent line as y equals 
Uh, the constant term here is 28, that's f of a, plus f prime of a is 36 times x minus 3. Looks like the answer is going to be choice C. The slope is 36. If you want to double, double check, go ahead and distribute and simplify. 36x minus, that's an x there, minus 36 times 3 is minus 108. It simplifies to 36x. 28 minus 108 is going to be minus 80. And that does confirm that C is the correct answer. Okay? That's the first problem. So we need the derivative um, formula. We need to know how to take derivatives. We need the formula for the equation of the tangent line to do, solve that problem. And then we need to just use our algebra skills. On to problem two. Oh, an integral. There we go. Looks a little complicated looking. Um, hopefully you've done enough integral practice to see that you should use a substitution here. If this integral were the integral of 1 over square root of x, which is the same as x to the negative 1 half power, then you could use the inverse power rule for integration to solve that. It's not that there's a 4 plus 7x inside there, but a substitution will make it uh, look like that. Let u equal the thing inside the square root, 4 plus 7x. Of course, you should know you need to find du in this case. du dx is going to be the constant function 7. If you imagine, quote unquote, multiplying both sides by dx, you can write du equals 7 dx. Now, that's not literally what's going on, but it does get you to the right answer. All right? And it's a definite integral, so if we change to the new variable u, we need to also change our limits of integration. This is a common mistake people make. If you're going ahead and doing the definite integral as is, when you get it in terms of the new variable, u in this case, you need to change those limits of integration for definite integrals. You don't have to do it for indefinite ones. If du is 7 dx, then dx is going to be 1 7 du. So the dx gets re replaced by 1 7 du. This 4 plus 7x gets replaced by u itself. We've got 1 over the square root of u. That's the same as u to the negative 1 half power. Don't forget your 1 7. And again, change your limits of integration. How? We need to use the equation that defines the new variable. When x is 0, plug in x equals 0 there, you'll get u is 4. And when x is 3, plug in x equals 3 here, you'll get 7 times 3 is 21, plus 4 is u equals 25. Now we can do this integral straight away with the fundamental theorem of calculus, using these new limits of integration. And the reverse or inverse of the power rule, I need to now add 1 to that exponent, negative 1 half plus 1 half or plus 1 is positive 1 half, and divide by that same number. This can always be checked by differentiation. Uh, this is a 1 7th here. Sorry about that. Upside down. Not sure why it's not erasing for me here. It's a 1 7th. Don't need a plus C because it's a definite integral. Going from 4 to 25. Uh, dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2, so we're going to get 2 sevenths, 25 to the 1 half, minus 4 to the 1 half, that's the same as 5 minus 2, or 3. So in the end, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 sevenths is the final answer, that is choice B. It's hard to really know for sure by making a graph that that really is right. Though it should seem probably that 42 is wrong if you make a, a decent graph of this. We are after the area under the curve between 0 and 3. The function value here when x is 0 is 1 over square root of 4, which is 1 half. We're after that area right there. And you can see for sure that's less than 3 times a half. For sure that's less than 1.5. 6 sevenths is less than 1.5. You'd have to ballpark these numbers as well to double check those. This is perhaps the other plausible answer is choice C. Um, based on estimating the square root of 3 to be whatever it is, I think maybe 1.7 or something like that. But this is the right answer. Okay? On to the third problem. Let's see if it erases now. I guess it does. If you um, just find the antiderivative, by the way, first of, in this problem, number 2, you can go back to the original limits of integration, but I find it better to go ahead and change the limits of integration. All right, this one looks complicated. <clears throat> We've got a function capital F of x defined by an integral. Notice the variable for this function is in the upper limit of the integral. 
this is always kind of a strange problem for people. They're usually not quite sure how to deal with this. But you need to realize that this is based on what's often called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It's really, to me, just the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's maybe more even general than what people call the first fundamental theorem of calculus. To differentiate such a function that's an integral like this, essentially you just get rid of the integral sign. But this integrand needs to have the original variable plugged in. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> if you want to find the derivative with respect to x of an integral of this form, where a down here is a constant, and x is the true variable for this new function that you're defining, of whatever function you have in here, essentially the derivative symbol and the integral symbol cancel and the dt goes away as well, you get the original integrand, but you should use the same letter for the variable that you're differentiating with respect to. So that actually makes this problem easy. All you have to do is write that down with an x in place of a t. 2 plus uh, sine 4x is going to be the answer for the derivative. And that is an option. Okay. So even though it's complicated looking, it really is pretty easy. Now I'm not explaining why this works here. Uh, that should be something that you get from your teacher. But it definitely is true. There will be one problem later, I believe, in this test where it's a little trickier because it's not just an x up there, like an x squared or an x cubed. And then we'll have to use the chain rule as well. That can make it trickier. An alternative way to do this problem, which is worth showing you to see that you get the same answer, is to go ahead and do this definite integral pretending x is a constant using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Find an antiderivative of this. You can write it in terms of t, and, and in fact you should write it in terms of t. Uh, 2t minus, uh, well, I'm using a substitution in my head to write minus 1 fourth cosine of 4t. t goes from 2 to x. Now plug in x, get 2x minus 1 fourth cos 4x, and then subtract what you get when you plug in 2. 2 times 2 is 4 minus 1 fourth cos 8. And then differentiate that. This thing here is a constant. It differentiates to 0. So you only have to differentiate this. With respect to x, what will you get? You'll get a 2, like we have a 2 up there. Using the chain rule, you'll get plus 1 fourth sine 4x times 4. The extra times 4 would be from the chain rule. And the times 4 at the end would cancel with the 1 fourth to give you a plus sine of 4x. So you can do it that way, but this is quicker, just using the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It also has the advantage of working even if this function is hard or impossible to integrate. This fact here still works, so it's definitely worth learning. Moving on to problem four. Uh, this one looks a little nicer. It's a pure derivative problem. Though we do need the chain rule, and in fact, if you think about it, we need it twice. Let's be careful how we write this. We're taking the derivative of a composition. The innermost function is 3x. When you first plug a number in for x, you need to multiply by 3 right away. That's the most inner function. Then you would need to take the sine of the function, of that, of that output, 3 times x, and then square it. Then remember this notation means do the squaring last. The chain rule says take the derivative of the outermost function, which is the squaring function. The derivative of the squaring function is 2 times the variable. So bring down that 2 and subtract 1 from that exponent. But in place of the x, we plug in the inner function. Okay, you should have seen the chain rule and practiced it plenty already, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Then multiply times the derivative of the inner function. Let me go ahead and write it like this to begin with. So there is the first step of this two-part chain rule problem. The second and final step is to take the derivative of this with the chain rule again the inner function being 3 times x, the outer function being the sine function. 
derivative of the sine function is the cosine function multiplied by an extra factor of 3 because of the chain rule again. Simplify, you get 6 sine 3x times cos 3x. And that is this choice. Of course, multiplication is commutative. So that's the same as what you see right there. This is a, an S here. That's sine. Okay? So that would be problem number four. On to number five. I hope you're pausing the video and doing these problems on your own. Here we actually have to evaluate an integral with an x in the upper limit of integration. We're not actually differentiating this thing. It's not asking for the derivative of it. If it were asking for the derivative, we'd use that second fundamental theorem of calculus again. But here we actually have to do the integral. It is possible, though it's complicated looking. If you want to be extra careful about it, you should do a substitution. You want to use the fact that the derivative of tangent is secant squared, so the integral, the indefinite integral, we write it as secant squared of x, is tangent of x plus c. We need that fact here to help us do this more complicated integral. Again, along with the substitution, if you want to be careful, you want to let u be this thing inside. Then du will be a constant times dt, and we see a constant 6 out there, times dt. This is indeed the best substitution to make. du is going to be 3 dt. That means, uh, well, we want to replace 6 dt with something. We can multiply both sides of this by 2. 2 du will be 6 dt. And remember, this is a definite integral. We should change the limits of integration. When, at, oh, when t is 0, Use this equation, you'll get u is pi over 4. If we were doing this as a definite integral, we want to do that. There actually is a way to solve this problem thinking of this as an indefinite integral. I'll come to that at the end. So when t is 0, u is pi over 4. When t is x, plug in t equals x here, you get 3x plus pi over 4. That's the upper limit of the integral. Secant squared u, we also have... 60t being replaced by 2du. Now we can use that first fundamental theorem of calculus, carry the 2 along, we get 2 tangent of u, u goes from pi over 4 up to 3x plus pi over 4, there's our antiderivative plug in the top limit of integration to get 2 times tangent of 3x plus pi over 4 minus what you get when you plug in the bottom limit of integration pi over 4. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Pi over 4 is 45 degrees. Tangent is sine divided by cosine. Sine and cosine of 45 degrees are the same. Therefore, they divide to 1. So we get 2 times 1 or just 2. And this is option B right here. That is the answer. Another way you can do this problem is to realize by the second fundamental theorem of calculus that this definite integral where x is the variable in that upper limit of the integral is an antiderivative of the integrand, this function here. It's got to involve tangent. So you find that antiderivative with, a little, with substitution, again, if you want to think of it as an indefinite integral. But with a plus c, and you'd have to figure out the c to be equal to 2, and the reason you would know it was, well, minus 2, the reason you know it would be minus 2 is because when you plug in x equal to 0 in this integral, you're doing the integral from 0 to 0, the answer's got to be 0. So when I have a plus c here, in order to make this expression equal to 0 when x is 0, I need the c to be minus 2, because tangent of pi over 4 is 1, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 plus c would have to be 0, therefore c would have to be minus 2. If that went by too fast, you want to understand it, rewind that part by about a minute or two. Okay? Let's go on to number 6. Physics application here. A particle starts at time t equals 0 and moves along a number line. 
so that it's this position at time t equals, that's a typo, at time t is given by this formula right there, a fourth degree polynomial in t. The particle is moving to the right for what? For blank. You've got to fill in one of these answers. You can actually solve this problem without using calculus, or at least you can guess the right answer, perhaps, although this never makes it uh, perhaps a little bit uncertain. Because you can graph this function, and you can graph it reasonably well without calculus. How? Well, you know it's horizontal intercepts are t equals 5 and t equals 1. Here's 1. Here's 5, say. It's a fourth degree poly uh, polynomial in t. The end behavior is going to be like this, going up forever and ever as t either goes to plus infinity or minus infinity. It's got these intercepts. The intercept at 1 is also a triple root. What that means, if you've got enough experience with this, is it's got to come and cross the t-axis about like that. before coming back and crossing the t-axis again at 5. x is a function of t, has to look something like this. Now, actually, we're only thinking about this when t is positive, but don't worry about that. We're wondering, when is the particle moving to the right? This is its position, say, along a horizontal x-axis. It starts to the right of 0, because x of 0 is positive. It's moving to the left, actually, whereas t increases because this function is going down. The x-coordinate of the point on the graph is going down, so that means motion is to the left. It's going to start moving to the right at this value of t, because that's where the graph of x changes from decreasing to increasing. And thereafter, it's always going to be moving to the right because the function is increasing. So we move past the position 0 and continue on to positive positions. So if any of these answers is going to be right, it's got to be this one. That's the only one that fits this situation. And the never is not an option, because it definitely moves to the right, because this function definitely increases. If you want to check it with calculus, it's, you're certainly welcome to. You'd want to differentiate this function to find the velocity and figure out when the velocity is 0. However, it's best to resist the temptation to expand this out. Don't do t minus 1 cubed with Pascal's triangle, for example. Leave it in factored form and differentiate it as is with the product rule. You've got a first function and a second function. We'll need the product rule, and we'll also need the chain rule when we differentiate that part, though it'll be sort of a trivial application of the chain rule. The product rule says to take the derivative of a product like this, differentiate, say, the left function, t minus 5 uh, differentiates to 1, times the right function, t minus 1 quantity cubed, plus the left function, t minus 5, times the derivative of the right function, which I need, again, need the chain rule for. Bring the 3 down in front. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Multiply times the derivative of the inside, which is just 1. That will be the velocity as a function of time. I differentiated to find that. Don't expand this out either. Factor it. You've got a common factor of t minus 1 squared in both spots. Because you have a t minus 1 to the third power there and a t minus 1 squared there. When you factor it out, here you're left with a factor of t minus 1, and here you're left with a factor of 3 times, in parentheses, t minus 5. If you simplify this, you get a 3t and another t is a 4t, and you have a minus 1 and a minus 15 is a minus 16, and that is the same as 4 times, in parentheses, t minus 4. So at v of t, the velocity, is 4 times t minus 1 cubed times t minus 4. And then you can think about where that's positive and negative. When t is bigger than 4, it's certainly positive. And you can check when t is less than 1 or between 1 and 5, it's negative, actually. I'll leave that to you to check. A is indeed the answer, number 6. All right, so that means we're one-fifth of the way done here. And 30 questions total. How long has that taken? I should keep track as well, about 25 minutes or so. So we're shooting for about a 100-minute video here, hopefully less than two hours. All right, number seven, an equation of the line tangent to the graph of that cubic that you see over there. 
A little tricky here. Be careful. At its point of inflection is given by one of these. Not at an arbitrary point, not at a critical point, at a point of inflection. Where are points of inflection? They're points where the graph changes concavity, either from concave up to concave down, or vice versa, from concave down to concave up, which means the second derivative changes sign. The first derivative is going to be 6x squared minus 6x. We will need that derivative to find the slope of the tangent line that we're after. And the second derivative is going to be 12x minus 6, which is the same as 6 times in parentheses 2x minus 1. Where does that change sign? Well, it equals 0 when x is 1 half. If you set this equal to 0 and solve for x, that means 2x equals 1, which means x equals 1 half. And in fact, that will be the x coordinate of the inflection point because this will change sign as x increases through 1 half. When x is less than 1 half, it's 6 times a negative number, a negative second derivative. The graph is concave down. When x is bigger than 1 half, you plug in like 1 there, you get a positive second derivative. The graph is concave up. There's a change in inflection at x equals 1 half. That is the inflection point. Now we need to find, um, again, the equation of the tangent line at that point. We'll need to plug it into the original function and the first derivative. We're not using function notation here originally, but that doesn't have to stop us from using function notation now. Y of 1 half means plug in 1 half into here. 1 half cubed is 1 eighth. I'm looking right there. Minus 3 times 1 half squared is 1 fourth plus 2. Get a common denominator of 8. This will be 2 minus 6 plus uh, 16 over 8. Double check that. Uh, yeah, that looks good. And 2 minus 6 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 16 is 12. 12 eighths or 3 halves or 1.5 is the function value at x equals 0. What about the derivative value at 1 half? y prime of 1 half. You have the derivative here is 6 times 1 half squared is 6 times 1 fourth minus 6 times 1 half. Get a common denominator of 4. That would be 6 minus 12 over 4, negative 6 fourths, or a negative 3 halves. And now find the equation of the tangent line. Come back over here. Let's use that formula. Y is uh, f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a like we had with the very first problem. F of a is y one half is three halves. F prime is minus three halves. And again, a is one half here. Distribute the minus three halves through the parentheses, get three halves minus three halves x plus three fourths. Simplifying to minus three halves x, three halves plus three fourths will be six fourths plus three fourths is plus nine fourths. And that is choice. A. Okay, so that's the answer to number seven. What do we have for number eight? A pretty complicated looking integral. Definite integral of substitution. Definitely beneficial here. We are lucky in the sense that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So if we let u be tangent of x, du will be secant squared x dx. That's the best thing to do. Sometimes if you're not sure if it's going to be good, you just have to try it and see what happens. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. So we get the integral of 1 over u du which is going to give us a logarithm. But again, like I mentioned in a previous problem, if I want to keep this as a definite integral in this new variable, I have to change the limits of integration. Which does mean you need to know the tangent of pi over 6 and the tangent of pi over 3, or at least be able to figure it out. Tangent of pi over 6, 30 degrees, is sine of pi over 6 divided by cosine of pi over 6. Sine of 0 is 0, then you increment up to 1 half at 30 degrees. Sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. 
and cosine of pi over 6. Cosine of 0 is 1. You've got to go down to square root of 3 over 2. These are some memorized values. That's the same as 1 half times 2 over root 3. The 2's cancel, leaving you 1 over root 3, which is the same as root 3 over 3, of course, but you probably can leave it like this. How about tangent of uh, pi over 3, the upper limit of the integral, which is 60 degrees? That'll be sine of 60 divided by cosine of 60 degrees. You'll just be flipping these. You'll get square root of 3 over 2 divided by 1 half. That's going to be the same as square root of 3. Probably best to actually leave it like this then when you compare these things. So that'll be our new limits of integration, square root of 3 over 3. Well, actually, I think maybe I will leave it as 1 over square root of 3. And in fact, I'll write that as 3 to the negative 1 half power. This is the same as 3 to the negative 1 half power. Let's write that down here. Now, up here, let's write that as 3 to the positive 1 half. There's a good reason for doing that, because I'm going to use properties of logarithms to help me simplify. We get the log of u. If you want to be careful, you could put the absolute value signs in there, but neither of those limits of integration are negative, so it won't matter. We got a 3 to the negative 1 half down here and a 3 to the positive 1 half up here. And so we get natural log of 3 to the positive 1 half minus natural log of 3 to the negative 1 half from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Property of logs is you can bring these powers up, up in front here. We'll get 1 half natural log of 3. And then we'll get a plus 1 half natural log of 3 again. Because when I bring that negative 1 half in front, it cancels with this minus sign to give me a plus sign. 1 half natural log of 3 plus 1 half natural log of 3 is just natural log of 3. The answer is choice D right there. Number nine, we have a graph. And what does the problem say? It says the function, as you can see in the graph, is continuous. It's a piecewise linear graph when x is between negative 3 and positive 3. It consists of five line segments. The question is, what is the average value of f on this interval from negative 3 to 3? Here you need to know the formula for average value continuous function over some interval from a to b. It is 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of the function. Effectively, if the graph is above the axis, it's the average, it's the height of a rectangle whose area is the same as the area under the graph. But this graph goes both above and below the axis, which makes it a little bit trickier. This integral, you can see, is probably going to be negative. The graph is, when it's below the axis, the area of this region plus the area of that region is more than the area of this region. And they contribute negatively to the integral. That's something to know. A is negative 3, B is positive 3. So in the bottom we get 1 over 3 minus negative 3 is 1 sixth. You do not want to do this integral with antiderivatives, okay? Not the fundamental theorem of calculus. You want to think about sine derivatives. And the fact that these things are straight line segments helps you. And in fact, you get a little extra help by looking at the boxes, which each have a, an area of 1. Um, the area of these two boxes together gives you 2. The area of this box, or the, this triangle here, would be 1, 1 half base times height. But it will cancel with this triangle's areas. Because again, you need to think in terms of signed area as far as the integral goes. You get a positive area for this triangle, but a negative area of this triangle. They cancel each other for the integral. Um, this one has an area 1 half base times height would be 1. This triangle has a height of 3 and a base of 1. Its area, 1 half base times height, 1 half 3, well, 1 times 3 is 3 halves, but it will contribute negatively to the integral. And then this area here, these three boxes, is 3. To emphasize they contribute negatively to the integral, you might want to put minus signs in there. It depends on how you're thinking about it. So it looks like the integral is going to be 1 6 times negative 2, 
Again, these two areas canceled because one was below the axis, one was above it. Plus one, minus three halves, minus three. Negative two plus one is negative one, minus three is negative four. Negative four minus three halves will be negative 11 halves. This is negative 11 halves times 1 sixth. The final answer is negative 11 twelfths right there. Choice A. So you want to be able to use geometry to calculate integrals whenever it's convenient. Definitely with a piecewise linear function like that, we do not want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, when an area of an expanding square, a square that's getting bigger, hmm, that should trigger light bulbs in your mind, is this going to be a related rates problem? And yeah, it will be, though kind of a, not a typical related rates problem. The area is expanding in square units, like meters squared or something. When it's increasing, at a, at a certain moment in time, it's increasing four times as fast as the side is increasing in linear units, in say meters per second. What length is the side? That's what we're after. I'll draw a square, but you know, squares are so easy to draw and imagine in your mind that you don't really need to. The area of the square is x squared. But it's an expanding square. It's getting bigger over time. There's a hidden variable in this picture related to the problem statement, time. Both the area and x depend on time. And in fact, they're getting bigger as t gets bigger because it's an expanding square. You can differentiate both sides with respect to t. And you do not get 0 either way because these are functions of t. And maybe for a little extra emphasis on the right-hand side, you might want to write x squared as x of t squared. You may prefer doing that because that emphasizes you really do need the chain rule there. We've got a composition of two functions, an inner function, x of t, which we don't know the formula for, but we don't need to. And then the outer function is the squaring function. The chain rule would say, take the derivative of the outer function, bring down that 2 and subtract 1 to get 2x of t to the first power, but I'll just write it as an x to the first, times the derivative of the inside, which would be x prime of t if I'm using this notation. Back here, I can write it as dx dt if I'm using the Leibniz notation. Okay? This is pretty tricky for people. You really need to think carefully about what's going on. You need to use your imagination. The square is getting bigger over time. a and x both depend on t. When I differentiate with respect to t, I do not get 0. In my mind, I'm thinking of these as functions of t. All right, how do we finish the problem? At some moment in time, when x is some quantity, dA dt is four times bigger than dx dt. dA dt is four times dx dt, not for all t's, but at the moment in time that we're interested in moment in time. This only works at that moment in time, but that's good enough to solve the problem because now we can replace the dA dt in this formula with 4 dx dt equals 2x dx dt. And it is an expanding square. dx dt is not 0. We can cancel the dx dt's. We can cancel this 2 with this 4 to leave a 2. And it looks like the answer is x equals 2. Two linear units, for example, meters. Okay? And that is the correct answer. Number 11. Particle moves along the x-axis. We saw one of these before as well. According to some function, actually this function is different though. This time we are given the velocity, v, not x. This is a different problem. The question is, is what value of, v, of t does v attain its minimum? Okay, not your typical kind of particle motion problem, but certainly something we can do. Now you can't use a calculator, but let's just quick draw a quick sketch of what this might look like to at least believe we're going to get a minimum. If t is really, really small, 
really, really close to zero, but positive, like 0 0.001 or something. You've got e to a number close to zero, which is close to one, divided by a very small number. Positive number close to one divided by a very small number. The output's going to be very big when t is close to zero. When t is large, 10, 100, 1,000, a million, you got, if t is a million, for example, e to the 2 million divided by a million. I hope you know e to the 2 million is a lot bigger than a million. This is going to be a very large quantity when t is large. Somewhere in between, there's got to be a minimum. The graph has to look something like that. It's not technically a parabola, but you might say it's parabola-like, at least in here, okay? But this is not a quadratic. It doesn't matter that it's the velocity function. It doesn't matter what it rep represents. To find the min, we need to figure out where the tangent line is horizontal. We need to find the critical point of this function. We do need to find the acceleration function. But you don't have to call it acceleration. You don't even have to think about the fact that it represents acceleration. We're just after a minimum. We're trying to minimize this function. It's quotient. I can use the quotient rule. I've got a high function, e to the 2t, and a low function, t. The chain rule says, I remember it as low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. Low is t function. d high means the derivative of the high. The derivative of v to the 2t, I need the chain rule for that to get 2e to the 2t minus high d low, e to the 2t times the derivative of t, which is 1, divided by the square of what's below, divided by t squared. I want to find a critical point for this function. v is a function of t. I want to minimize it. I need to set this equal to 0 and solve for t. The only way a fraction can be 0 is if the numerator, the top, is 0. And there's an e to the 2t that can be factored out of the top and is never 0. So the only way this can be 0 is if that's 0. And that's going to occur at t equals 1 half. That's the critical point. Will it really be a min there? Evidently, this is 1 half. You can just in your mind think quickly about the first derivative test. If the derivative changes sign from negative, because the function is decreasing, to positive when it increases at a critical point, that's going to be a local min. In fact, in this case, global min. Does this derivative, well, this is part of the derivative. There's got to divide by t squared as well, but that's positive. The sign of this thing is the same as the sign of the derivative dv dt. Certainly when t is less than 1 half, this is negative times a positive. You get a negative. The original function is decreasing, like I guessed. And when t is bigger than 1 half, you get a positive times a positive. The derivative is positive. The function is increasing. It will be a min. t equals 1 half is the correct answer. All right, here's one of those uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus problems. But now, this time, we've got not just an x on the top, but an x cubed. To find the derivative, we really need the chain rule in addition to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Why? Well, if you want to be extra careful about it, you can define two functions. Let g of x be the integral that you see here, except just an x up top. Second fundamental theorem of calculus would say the derivative of g is the same brand, replace the t with an x like I talked about earlier. And let h of x be the cubic function, x cubed, which is this upper limit. Then this capital F function defined by this integral with this quantity in the upper limit of the integral is a composition. What gets done first when you plug a number in for x? The cubing function gets done first. That's the inner function. Then you integrate it. G is the outer function, H is the inner function. The chain rule will imply that capital F prime of an arbitrary number x is the derivative of the outer function, G. Plug in the inner function, H of x equals x cubed, times the derivative of the inner function. Again, the derivative of g by the second fundamental theorem of calculus is this function right there, except with an x. 1 over 1 plus x to the fourth. But we're plugging h of x into that. And h of x equals 
x cubed. So I need to take x cubed and raise it to the fourth power, which would ultimately give me x to the twelfth down there, times h prime of x times 3x squared. So we ultimately get 3x squared over 1 plus x to the twelfth. We are after what? After f prime of negative 1. Plug in negative 1. 3 times negative 1 squared is 3 divided by 1 plus negative 1 to the 12th power is 1. 3 halves is the derivative of capital F at negative 1, and that is choice A. Okay? Notice there's really no other way we could have done this. This function, 1 over 1 plus t to the 4th, is actually really hard to integrate. Um, its answer would involve having to do some complicated things with partial fractions after you, you factor this in a certain way, which is not so clear how to factor it. Uh, is probably the product of two quadratics that are probably irreducible themselves. You, you get, it would be a mess. Arc tangents would be involved in that kind of thing. You do not want to try to do that integral by hand. This is definitely the way to go. And I did use the second fundamental theorem of calculus. I'll call it FTC2 at this spot right there when I found G prime. All right? So you've got to know your concepts well and then just take a breath and use them. As I've shown you before, it's also good to have knowledge about graphs, and that's certainly the case in this problem. We are after an absolute or global minimum value of a function over a closed interval, which in general occurs either at the end points of the interval or at the critical points inside. However, we really could solve this problem without doing calculus, because we, if we know the graph of x to the two-thirds, this is nothing more than a transformed version of that graph. By replacing x with x minus 3, it's going to translate it to the right by 3 units. And then by having a plus 2 out there, it's going to translate it up by 2 units. The graph of x to the 2 thirds, well, it's good to remember, it looks like that. So translate to the, uh, to the right by 3 and then up by 2. Our function f of x itself is going to have a global min or absolute min at 3, and the output there will be 2, and the graph will look like this. So the global min value, value here means output, is going to be 2, right there. If you differentiated this, all that it really gains you is just seeing that 3 is a critical point. And even calculation that I'm showing you right now is not really a proof that it's a critical point. You'd really have to go back to the limit definition of the derivative to see that, for sure. It's one-third there. 2 over 3 times x minus 3 to the positive one-third in the bottom of the fraction there. That's undefined at x equals 3. There, there is a critical point at x equals 3. And it is, if you know the graph, without a calculator, it's the location of Goldman. And it doesn't matter that I chose negative 5 and 11 here um, to focus on. Those are the endpoints of the interval. As far as the global max, if you were asked for the global or absolute max value, you, it would occur either at negative 5 or 11. And in fact, those are both 8 units away from 3, so that the global max occurs at either one of them. And its value would be. Um, 8 to the 2 thirds, which is uh, 4, plus 2 is 6. That would be the global max value is 6. That's how high it gets on the interval from negative 5 to 11, if you were asked that. But we're not asked that, so the answer is 2. This test does test your endurance, and it's you know, only one part of the actual AP test, so a lot to do. All right, in problem 14, we've got a slope field. A slope field for a differential equation. dy dx equals some expression involving x and y in general, though our right-hand sides only depend on x. The graph is not labeled, but it certainly would be labeled in the usual way, x on the horizontal axis and y on the vertical axis. How, does, how is the slope field made? And what is it, how is it related to differential equations? What you do is, given any point in the plane, say we take a point right about here, when x is about, say, oh, 2.3, 
and y is about, it looks like maybe negative 1.3 or something like that. And the concept is you plug it into the right-hand side of the differential equation, and then you make a little line segment through that point, centered on that point, whose slope equals whatever you get when you plug that point into the function. That's a lot to think about. I'll say it again. Take any point in the plane, like this point, 2.3, negative 1.3, plug it into the right-hand side of the differential equation to get a number, make a line segment whose slope is that number. Now this line segment here looks like its slope is in the ballpark of negative 1. So what that would mean is when I plug in this point into the right-hand side, I would get about negative 1. How is it related to the answer, and what does it mean? What we're after with a differential equation like this is a function whose derivative, whose slope at every point, equals the output of the right-hand side function. And what that means is that solution curves, when they pass through a given point in the slope field, have to have the line segment centered at that point be a tangent line. The slope of the solution, dy dx, has to equal the slope of that little tangent line, because that's how we made this picture. So how does that help us figure out the answer? Again, these things all depend on x, and that's why, in a sense, this slope field is constant along vertical lines. It doesn't matter what y is when x is fixed. You're going to get the same slope along those vertical lines. Notice that the slope field is close to zero when x is zero. There could be some horizontal lines in here that are not actually drawn. And, for example, when x is about 3.1 or 3.2, and hmm, that sounds like it's close to pi. And In fact, our answers are all trig functions. It probably is pi, where the slope is back to zero. So certainly my answer has to have a right-hand side that equals zero when x is zero. That rules out this one. The right-hand side does not equal zero when x is zero, giving us one of these three as the answer. How do we continue to narrow it down? If x is slightly positive here, notice these line segments have negative slope. So I'm after a right-hand side function that would give me slightly negative numbers when x is slightly positive, like that one. Not this, and in fact, not this. Secant times tangent is the same as sine x over cosine x. That's co squared x, in fact. That's not negative when x is slightly positive. This has got to be the answer. And in fact, if you think about it some more, you can confirm in another way that it's the answer. What we're after here is a function whose derivative, dy dx, always equals negative sine x. We're after an antiderivative of negative sine of x, which is cosine of x. And in fact, one graph that follows the slope field is the cosine function, about like this or so. And this is definitely not a perfect drawing, but about like that, there's the cosine function, and it does look like it follows the slope field. Its derivative, we know, is negative sine x, which we guessed was the answer already. That's another way to confirm that that is the right answer choice C. Fifteen. Oh boy, this looks relatively easy. I thought that sounded funny when you turn that around, but it worked anyway. Just take the derivative. This is the easiest problem we've had so far, it seems. We do need the chain rule. We've got arctangent of 4x. By the way, if the problem was phrased in this way, find the derivative of 2 times inverse tangent of x. Inverse tangent and arctangent are the exact same function. 4x inside, they're not just an x. The answer would be the exact same. Arctangent and inverse tangent are just different notations and different names for the exact same function. The inverse function of the tangent function when you restrict its domain to be negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now you should remember the derivative of arctangent or inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. But we have an extra 2 in there, so the 2 gets carried along for the ride. And also because of the chain rule, I need to plug in 4x in place of x and multiply times its derivative. That's a chain rule problem, plus memorizing the derivative, derivative of arctangent. 
Simplify this, you'll get 8 over 1 plus 16x squared, and that is choice A, and if it were not one of those choices in A, B, or C, the answer would be D, none of the above. The above. So that's a fairly simple one. Hopefully you can do that one if you encounter it on the exam in 30 seconds or less. All right, got a fifth degree polynomial here. We're after its inflection point or points. If you look at the answers. I said a little while ago, inflection points are where the second derivative changes sign. The original function changes from concave down to concave up or vice versa, concave up to concave down. So we need the first and second derivatives here, but we also need to think about where does it change sign. The first derivative is 15x to the fourth minus 20x cubed. The second derivative is going to be 60x cubed minus 60x squared. Where does that change sign? It's helpful to factor out as much as you can. 60x squared is as much as you can, leaving you with an x minus 1 inside here. Now what you want to do is you want to think about where does this change sign. Now you can just draw a number line to figure out where it changes from positive to negative. You could also think about what its graph looks like. It would be the graph of the second derivative, not the original function. It's 0 when x is 0 or 1. If I set this equal to 0 and solve for x, I get x is 0 or 1. You can see they got an x squared there. 0 is a double root of the second derivative. And that means it's actually not going to change sign at 0. You plug in a number less than 0. Um, got a 60 times a negative number squared is positive. Times x minus 1 will be negative. Y double prime is negative over here. You plug in a number between 0 and 1, you still get a negative second derivative. This part's always positive right there. It's this thing that determines the sign. On the other hand, when x is bigger than 1, then the second derivative is positive. So it only changes sign at 1. That is the key point, not 0, even though that is where the second derivative equals 0. It doesn't change sign there. The graph of the second derivative, y double prime as a function of x, it's going to look, uh, let's see, it's going to look like this. And you'll see that it does not change sign at x equals 0. So, looks like b has got to be the answer. You may want to check that when x is 1, y is negative 2 in the original function, and it is, it would be 3 minus 5 is negative 2 when you plug in x equals 1. b is the answer. Which of the following is true about the graph of this function over this interval? This is not a point here, this is an open interval. This one's pretty tricky. There's a temptation to take the derivative here, and you certainly can, but you can also solve this problem without calculus by just thinking carefully about what the graph of this function looks like when x is between negative 3 and positive 3. And those absolute values seem to mess things up. However, if x is between negative 3 and positive 3, we can get rid of the absolute values. If x is between negative 3 and positive 3, x squared minus 9 is going to be negative. We're taking this absolute value, so we want to take the absolute value of a negative number to get a positive number. And in fact, that positive quantity is going to be 9 minus x squared. If you graph x squared minus 9 as a function of x, it's got roots at plus or minus 3. That's a parabola looking about like this. When you take the absolute value of x squared minus 9, it's going to take that part that's below the axis there and flip it above the axis like this. 
And this piece of the graph, when x is between negative 3 and 3, is really a piece of the graph of 9 minus x squared. Okay, you can also check this with particular numbers if you want. What about the graph of f itself then? Between negative 3 and 3. You can graph this without calculus. You can just think about it. For one thing, we can plug in x equals 0 to find the y-intercept. When x is 0, f of x is 9. Oops, mistake here. This should be natural log of 9 minus x squared. You get natural log of 9, which is positive. You get a positive intercept. As x approaches either 3 or minus 3, the absolute value of x squared minus 9 is getting closer and closer to 0. Really close to 0. The natural log of the number, really close to 0, is a very large negative number. You've got vertical asymptotes for f of x at negative 3 and 3. The graph's got to look like this. It's not increasing, so a is wrong. It does not have a range equal to all real numbers. b is wrong. The range only goes up to natural log of 9 right here. It does not attain a relative minimum on 0, 0. It retains a relative max there. It does seem to be concave down. If you want extra confirmation, you can differentiate. You might wonder, do I need the second derivative of f? Well, effectively, you can show the first derivative is always decreasing. f prime of x by the chain rule is going to be 1 over 9 minus x squared times negative 2x. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. And then I also use the chain rule. Negative 2x over 9 minus x squared. When x is negative, and between negative 3 and positive 3, you've got negative of a negative is positive divided by a positive. It's positive. The derivative is positive when x is between negative 3 and 0. The slope of this function is increasing. Or it's positive. This function itself is increasing. Then when x gets bigger than 0, negative of a positive is negative divided by a positive when x is still less than 3. f prime is negative. The original function is decreasing. It is concave down. Okay? And c is the answer. After a tangent line to the curve here, and after kind of something kind of unusual about the tangent line, or after its y-intercept, not its x-intercept, and we're not using the tangent line to approximate the function, we're just trying to find its y-intercept. So you got to watch out for curveballs like that. That things you got to see how things are worded. We're after a y-intercept, but we will need the equation of the tangent line, so we're going to need the derivative. Chain rule gives me that for the derivative. The square root of x plus 8 is x plus 8 to the 1 half power. I bring the 1 half in front, subtract 1 from the exponent. 1, minus, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Plug in 1 into these functions because that is the x coordinate of the point we're thinking about. That's the a, so to speak. Back from problem number 1. Y of 1 is square root of 1 plus 8 is square root of 9 is 3. And Y prime of 1, plug it into the derivative, you get 1 over 2 square root of 9 is 1 over 2 times 3 is 1 sixth. So the equation of the tangent line at the point we're after here is 3 plus 1 sixth X minus 3. Oops, X minus 1, sorry. A is 1. That's 1 sixth x uh, plus 3 minus 1 sixth is plus 17 sixth. And we are after the y intercept when x is 0. When you plug in 0 into here, you get 17 sixth. Choice B is the answer. So be careful to read problems carefully. Make sure you're looking at how, what you're after, what's the goal.
IT is a bit more theoretical. There's not a particular graph or a particular formula. You need to understand concepts here. And the first initial concept to understand here is that this is true for all x. And that's the definition of an even function. draw a generic even function, it's got symmetry across the vertical axis. The graph to the right of the vertical axis, if it looks like that, can be reflected over the vertical axis to obtain the graph to the left of the vertical axis, looking about like this. We're assuming f prime of some number a exists. Let's pretend a is right um, here, say f prime of a exists and gives you the slope of that tangent line. We're after f prime of negative a. If a is over here, negative a is going to be right about here by the symmetry across the y-axis. And the slope of its tangent line is going to be negative, so it's got to be either c or d. And if, for example, you imagine that f prime of a is positive 5, it should seem reasonable by symmetry that f prime of negative a would be negative 5. It's got to be c. Is there some other way to confirm that? Um, let's see, you could verify that the derivative of an even function has to be odd, at least if you assume it's differentiable for all x. f prime of x always equals f, or f of x, excuse me, f of x always equals f of negative x. So that would mean f prime of x, differentiating both sides of this and using the chain rule on the right, equals f prime of x times the derivative of negative x, which is negative 1. So this is negative f prime of x. So the derivative function is odd. And that will mean f prime of negative a, if you replace x with negative a, will be negative f prime of a, a symbolic confirmation of c being the answer. Okay, so an even function has a derivative if it exists everywhere that's odd. And then if you plug in x equals negative a, you'll get the, this relationship here, which is choice c. Right, this one is kind of nasty looking. Take a breath. I need a breath. If you're with me the whole time here, that's pretty amazing. I commend you. This is a piecewise defined function, and we're saying it's continuous at x equals 1. What does that mean? It means that the limit as x approaches 1 of this function must equal the function value at 1, which by its piecewise nature equals k. So we want to choose k to equal the limit of this function as x goes to 1. However, calculating that limit is a bit tricky. In calculating the limit, you need the other expression because, again, technically, you've heard this before, the limit of the function only depends on its values near, in this case, 1, not at 1. That's something you should remember. And if we just plug in 1, hoping that this thing is continuous, we'd be dividing by 0. Can't do that. In fact, the numerator approaches 0 as x approaches 1 as well, because you get a square root of 9 minus the square root of 9 when you replace x with 1 in the top. This is a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. It is a situation where a L'Hopital's rule can be used. Another way to solve it is with an algebra trick of multiplying the top and the bottom by 
this thing here except with a plus sign. I think I will do it both ways. Let's try L'Hopital's rule first. This is L'Hopital. And what L'Hopital's rule says to do in such an indeterminate form case is to try to find the limit of a new fraction where the numerator of the new fraction is the derivative of this numerator. This, oops, mistake. You can see that seven there. There's a seven in here. It's hard to see. I need an extra factor of seven from the chain rule. In fact, I get minus seven halves times seven x plus two to the negative one half. And the denominator of the new fraction is the derivative of the original denominator, which is 1. If this limit exists, and it will, then this limit will exist and equal what this limit is. That's what L'Hopital's rule says in this situation. This thing is actually a continuous function at x equals 1. It's going to be 1 over 2 times the square root of 9 minus 7 over 2 times the square root of 9 still in the bottom there. 1 sixth minus 7 sixth is negative 6 sixth or negative 1. The answer is B. Let's try solving this problem another way without L'Hopital's rule. Using the trick that I mentioned a few minutes ago. The trick of multiplying the top and the bottom by the square root expression, except with a plus sign instead of a minus sign. This is a common trick in math. It's used with complex numbers, for example. And you call this resulting thing you multiply by the complex conjugate of the original thing. If you do it to the top, you have to do it to the bottom, so it doesn't change the function, at least when, when it exists. When x is not 1. And the reason this is a good idea is because it makes the numerator have all the square roots go away. When you FOIL, first times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, and last times last, the outside and inside terms cancel. First times first is going to be x plus 8. You got outside times outside, and inside times inside, the plus sign there with this plus sign, and the minus sign here with this plus sign make the outside and inside terms cancel. You should take the time to check that. Then we have last times last. Minus this times this is minus 7x plus 2. Make sure you use parentheses so you don't make a mistake there. The bottom must be kept as is. And we still can't plug in 1 yet because we have an x minus 1 down there. But if we simplify the top, it simplifies to negative 6x plus 6, which is the same as negative 6 times in parentheses x minus 1, that x minus 1 will cancel with this max, x minus 1. And that's not a problem because, again, technically speaking, what happens to the function at x equals 1 is irrelevant. I thought my finger could erase that, but okay, let's just leave it. The original function is not continuous at x equals 1, but this new modified form is continuous at x equals 1. And I did make another mistake here. I forgot my 7 again. 7 should be in here. Now plug in 1. Six, negative 6 divided by the square root of 9 plus square root of 9, negative 6 over 6 is once again negative 1. All right, so we get the same answer another way. It's good to be flexible and be able to solve problems in more than one way if you can. All right, we're after, we've got this function here. Now what are we after? We're after on what interval it's increasing on. So where is its derivative positive? I would encourage you to try to think about this without calculus. 
Think about what the graph of x to the 2 thirds looks like. Think about what the graph of 4 minus 3x looks like. And then what their product would look like. It can be solved without calculus, especially when it's a multiple choice exam. The answer is either going to be A or C, but we need to figure out which one. And the derivative is more ideal for that. I need the product rule and the chain rule. I've got a first function and a second function. The derivative of the first or the left function is 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Now simplify. Looks like it probably will be good to get a denominator of x to the 1 third because we have an x to the negative 1 third there. And maybe also a 3 in the, in the bottom here. So we'll have um, 2 times this expression up top. It'll be 8 minus 6x. We're going to have a 3x to the positive 1 third down here. And then I've got this minus 3x to the 2 thirds. When I multiply the top and the bottom of this, by uh, 3x to the 1 third, I'm going to get a minus 9x over 3x to the 1 third, just a plain minus 9x. So this simplifies to 8 minus 15x divided by 3x to the 1 third. I'm interested in knowing where is this positive, where f is increasing. It's certainly 0 at when the top is 0, which is 8 fifteenths, hmm, that makes me think probably A is the answer. 8 fifteenths. It's undefined when x is 0. Those are critical points of the original function. And what is the sign in these different intervals, just to be sure about things? When you plug in a negative number, like negative 1, say, 8 minus 15 times negative 1 is 8 plus 15, which is positive, but the cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. A positive divided by a negative is negative. So f prime is negative up here. When you're between 0 and 8 fifteenths, for example, uh, you know, 1 tenth or whatever, you got 8 minus 15x uh, will be positive. And the cube root of a positive number is positive. f prime is going to be positive in here. And let's just confirm when x is bigger than 8 fifteenths that we get a negative derivative. Plug in a number like 1, you get a negative divided by a positive. f prime is negative here. So this is the interval that we're after. Choice A is the answer. And you can double check that with your calculator. In this problem, we've got a continuous function on a closed interval from 0 to 10. It's got values given in this table that you see. We're after, after a trapezoidal approximation of this definite integral with three subdivisions indicated by the data. We're saying that that approximation equals 62. What's the value of k? What's the value of this function when x equals 7? The trapezoidal approximation can be found by doing the average of left and right hand sums. <clears throat> It can also be found by finding the area of trapezoids. Let's do it as the average of left-hand and right-hand sums, because maybe you've forgotten the formula for the area of a trapezoid. It's not difficult. It's the base times the average of the heights. But I think you'd probably be less likely to make a mistake if we average the left and right-hand sums. So let's plot these points. Let's redo this. I shouldn't hold the eraser and the marker at the same time. When x is 0, f of x is 4. When x is 4, let's just make this a little bit more elongated on the horizontal axis, f of x is 6. So the second coordinate of that point is 6. When x is 7, notice the delta x here is changing from 4 to 3 and then to 3 again. f of x is k. Let's just pretend k is bigger than 6. There's k. And when, f, when x is 10, f of x is 8. <clears throat> so delta x is 4 for the first interval, 3 for the second, and 3 for the third. For the left-hand sum, 
We take the values of the function at the left endpoints of each interval to determine the height of the rectangles and then add up the areas of those rectangles. So for the first interval from 0 to 4, the value of the function at the left endpoint, x equals 0, is 4. So I make a rectangle of height 4. And the area would be 16. When x is 4, uh, when, when we're in this interval from 4 to 7, take the left endpoint 4, plug it into the function to get 6, and use that to determine the height of the rectangle. And finally, over the last interval from 7 to 10, the left endpoint is 7. Function output there is k. That determines the height of the last rectangle. <clears throat> so, the left-hand sum with three subdivisions is this first function value, 4, times the first delta x, which is 4, plus the second function value, 6 when x is 4, right there, that height right there, is 6 times this delta x, this one's 4, this one's 3, and this one's 3, 6 times 3, and then for the last interval, at the left end, point 7, we have the value of k, and the base is 3. Simplify a little bit. 16 plus 18 is going to be 34. 34 plus 3k is the left-hand sum. What about the right-hand sum? <clears throat> then I take the right end points of each interval to determine the heights of the rectangles. So with the first interval from 0 to 4, I take the right end point 4, go up to that value of 6, and use that as the height of the first rectangle. For the second interval from 4 to 7, go to the right end point 7, go up to the height there, which is k. And then for the last interval, take the right endpoint 10, go up to the function value of 8, and use that as the height of the rectangle. So R3, looking at those dashed rectangles, which include the bottom parts, the first one has a height of 6 and a base of 4. Second one right here, going up to k, has a height of k and a base of 3. And the last one has a height of 8 and a base of 3. And this will simplify to 48 plus 3k. The trapezoidal sum, which equals 62, like I mentioned at the start, is the average of the left and right-hand sums. At least there's one way to do it. Again, another way is to find areas of trapezoids that would actually be connected here, here, and here, going down to the axis. So I need to add L3 and R3, 34 plus 3K and 48 plus 3K. 34 plus 48 is going to be 82. Uh, 3K plus 3K is 6K. I can divide both of those by 2 and get 41 plus 3K. That has to equal 62. Subtract 41 from both sides. 3K is 21. 21 there, sorry, it's not showing up very well. And then k is 7. 21. 7 is choice D. Feel like we're getting in the final home stretch here? You know this is long again. But we are getting close again. 30 problems total. Particle moves along the x-axis again. This one's tricky. So its distance from the origin at time t is given by this expression, a function of t. You can think of that as a position, if you prefer, because it is a distance to the origin. What is the total distance traveled? And there's an emphasis on the word total by this particle between time point 5 and time 2. You actually can solve this without calculus, but let's try it both ways. This is the distance. You could call it x. It is the same as the x-coordinate of the point as it moves. Because it, it's not a distance traveled. It's a distance to the origin. If you graph this as a function of t, and think about the fact that you can factor it as 4t times 2 minus t, it's got t intercepts at 0 and 2. And it's an upside down parabola because the coefficient of t squared is negative. We're interested in the total distance traveled 
back and forth between time 0.5 and time 2. Back and forth. At 0.5, it's moving in the rightward direction because x is increasing. At time 1, it looks like that's when it turns around and starts coming the other way when x becomes decreasing. Yeah, it's got to be at 1 because it's a quadratic. The vertex has to be halfway between the intercepts when there are intercepts. So the total distance traveled is really going to be the sum of two other distances. The distance between these two points on the y-axis, which are the second coordinates of the graph when t is 0.5 and when t is 1, plus the total distance between this point and the origin. The total distance from the picture is really going to be x of 1 minus x of 0.5 that's the distance traveled between these two values of x, plus the distance between this point and the origin, thinking of it as a positive quantity, even though this graph is decreasing. Thinking of it as moving to the left and it's still more distance is being traveled. To make that a positive quantity, we really need x of 1 minus x of 2. So you can do this problem without a calculus. We can use calculus, but, um, and I think I will double check that with calculus, but let's just do it this way first. x of 1, plug in 1 there, is going to get 8 minus 4. x of 0.5, 8 times 0.5 is 4. 0.5 squared is 0.25. We get a, a 4 minus 1 here, 3. I'll write it as 4 minus 1. x of 1, as before, is. 4. x of 2 is 0. Plug in t equals 2, you get 0. 4 minus 3 is 1, plus 4 is 5. The answer is 5. <clears throat> How would you do it with calculus? You'd integrate the velocity function. Or actually, I should say the absolute value of the velocity function. The velocity, which is the derivative of x with respect to t, is 8 minus 8t. The answer also equals the integral of the velocity point from 0.5 to 1, or to 2, excuse me, of the absolute value of the velocity. And you'd want to split that into two integrals, one from 0.5 to 1. When the velocity is positive, you can just get rid of those absolute value signs and write 8 minus 8t plus the integral from 1 to 2. 8 minus 8t is negative when t is bigger than 1. So its absolute value is actually going to switch those around and give you 8t minus 8. Um, yeah. And these two integrals by the FTC will give us these two values here and here, and we'll get the same answer. The second one might be a little confusing, because you might think in looking at this that it's x of 2 minus x of 1. But it's not because we switched, did the switching around of the 8 and the 8. 8 minus 8t became, became 8t minus 8. That was, that's the reason why we didn't, don't do x of 2 minus x of 1. You do want a positive quantity there. That's the key thing to keep track of. So doing it without calculus is actually better. You're probably less likely to make a mistake. Oops. 24. How many critical points does that function that you see there, that arctangent function, have? Critical points are where the function equals 0 or is where the derivative equals 0 or is undefined. What is the derivative of this? The chain rule, we get 1 over 1 plus the input squared, x squared minus 4x squared, and then by the chain rule, multiply times the derivative of that, which is 2x minus 4. How many times does this equal 0, or how many times is it undefined? It equals 0 when the numerator is 0, which only occurs when, at one point when x is 2. No other value of x will make this 0. It's never undefined for all real values of x, because this quantity is always greater than or equal to 1 plus 0. Because when you square a real number, you get a number greater than or equal to 0. 
So it's never undefined. It only equals zero at one point when x is two. Therefore, the answer is C, two. Oh, this one's scary looking. I'll take a breath. It's I'll give you the hint if you want to pause the video that it's a related rates problem. You might wonder where this formula comes from for the volume of a sphere. It's not the whole sphere, it's just a partial sphere. Um, I'm not going to go into where this formula comes from, but it can be figured out using integration by rotating a certain graph around an axis, essentially, and doing an integral. But we don't need to worry about that here. Spherical tank, there's a sphere of radius 5 meters, that's 5 meters. It's filling up with water, so there's a little hole on the top, water's coming in, and it's filling up with water at a constant rate, constant rate of 20 pi cubic meters per hour. When the water is h meters deep, this is the formula for the volume. And again, you don't need to worry about where that comes from, but it is right. What is the rate at which the depth of the water is increasing at the moment when the water is 2 meters deep? Which is about what that picture looks like when it's about 2 meters deep, if the radius is 5. It's a related rates problem. V and h both depend on t. And probably would be beneficial to go ahead and multiply this out. Pi over 3 times 15 is 5 pi. Don't forget the h squared. Then we have a minus pi over 3 times h cubed. V and h both depend on t. You could write this instead if it helps. Make the dependence on t explicit. If that helps, do it that way. It's traditional not to bother putting the t's in there. Just differentiate both sides with respect to t, keeping in mind that v and t both depend on t, so I don't get zero when I differentiate them with respect to t. And I need the chain rule. Bring down that 2 to get 10 pi h times the derivative of the inside function, dh dt. If you were differentiating this, you'd write it as 10 pi h of t times h prime of t. It's more clear that the chain rule is necessary if you think about it this way. The next one, bring the 3 down, it cancels with the 3 down there, it'll leave you minus pi h squared. Again, by the chain rule, you get another factor of dh dt. If you were thinking about it this way, you bring that 3 down to get a pi h of t squared times h prime of t. You need the chain rule. The goal is to find the rate at which the height is increasing. We need to solve for dh dt. It can be factored out of the right side, and then what's left over can be uh, divided by on both sides. So dh dt is going to be dv dt divided by uh, 10 pi h minus pi h squared. Um, dv dt is constant. Always equal to 20 pi cubic meters per hour. You can just go ahead and put a 20 pi in there. And both terms on the bottom have a factor of pi. So the pi can be canceled out and cancel, or can be factored out and then cancel on the top and the bottom. All these pi's go away. And you get 20 over 10h minus h squared. At any moment in time, and the white doesn't show up there in the lower right corner here. At any moment in time, this gives you dh dt. The rate at which h is increasing depends on h itself. To finish the problem, go ahead and plug in h equals 2. 10 times 2 is 20, minus 2 squared, minus 4 is 16. You have 20 sixteenths, which will reduce to 5 fourths meters per hour. 5 fourths is 1.25. D is the answer. Okay, just, so you just got to keep in mind that everything depends on T. The amount of uh, water 
its height, its depth, and its volume keeps increasing over time. Twenty-six. This one's a little weird. Got some data about a continuous function. A closed interval. But only that data. And you're wondering what can you say about it of these four options? You can plot the data, but the plot can be misleading, and, and that's part of the point of the problem is to help you realize you should not let the plot mislead you completely. When x is 1, f of x is negative 3, so let's pretend that's right there. There we go. When x is 2, f of x is 4, right about there. When x is 3, f of x is 6. When f is x is 4, f of x is 5. When x is 5, x is, f of x is 3. So about like that is the five points that we are given. And the nature of those five points makes you think the graph must be concave down, but that would be misleading. It doesn't have to be concave down. It doesn't really tell you anything about f double prime. That can't be the answer. As you look through b, c, and d, I hope you rule out c and d to see that b is the answer. Why are c and d ruled out? Well, f prime doesn't have to always be positive between 1 and 3. It, it sort of looks like it might be positive. But the graph actually could be going up and down, but yet still go through those points. It's not guaranteed to be true. That one's up. And the minimum value being negative 3, that's, you know, that's the value here. That's not necessarily true. The graph could go lower like that before coming back up through this other point that I kind of drew. So that's ruled out. But there must be a number c between 1 and 5 where the graph crosses the axis. That's based on the continuity of the function. It's got to cross the x-axis. It's the intermediate value theorem, IVT. If the function is negative on one side of the interval and positive on the other, and it's continuous, it's got to cross the x-axis somewhere. There's got to be a zero of the function, or root of it of c, where f of c equals 0. That's the true one. This one's also a bit tricky. For what value, all values of k for which this graph has three distinct x-intercepts. Wow. Well, it's a cubic. k is the vertical intercept. And the slope at x equals 0 is 0 because there's no linear term. The uh, second derivative at x equals 0 is 6. It's positive. Uh, it's not actually equal to 6. It's equal to 12, but it's positive. The graph's got to, in general, look like this. It's got to have that kind of shape to it. And in fact, the min will occur at x equals 0. Now, we're after values of k where this crosses the x-axis three times. But this place right here really will be at x equals 0. That will be the y-axis. We can confirm that with derivatives. y prime is 6x squared plus 12x, which can also be written as 6x times x plus 2. So it's also, the derivative is also equal to 0 at not only 0, but also at negative 2. This is negative 2 here. And the second derivative is 12x plus 12, same as 12 times x plus 1. The inflection point is at negative 1, no matter what k is. k just shifts this up and down. There's going to be some largest value k where you just barely have two x-intercepts. The graph looks like this. And you've got two at some largest value k where you have at least, where you have more than one x-intercept. In that case, you have two. And there's going to be some smallest value k where the graph also has exactly two intercepts and looks like this. The values of k, oops, I didn't draw that well. The vertical axis is here, not here. 
the values of k where you have three x-intercepts are between these two values of k that make the graphs look like this and this. And the key thing then is to think about, um, again, the fact that the critical points are negative 2 and 1. And when, when does the function equal 0 at those critical points? If you plug 0 back into the original function, y of 0 always equals k. So the k that's going to make the graph look like this is k equals 0. That's the k that's going to make the graph look like that. The largest value k where you just barely have more than one x-intercept. You have two, in fact. Because y of 0 equals k. k is the y-intercept of the graph. On the other hand, the graph's going to look like this when the other value of uh, y at the other critical point also equals 0. Plug that back into the original function. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8 times 2 is negative 16. Negative 2 squared is 4 times 6 is 24. What I'm trying to say is, so this is the value of the function at negative 2 for any value of k. That's going to equal 0 at negative 2 when k is negative 8. This is the picture when k is negative 8. So the graph's going to look like this, what you're after with three x-intercepts when k is between these two numbers, negative 8 and 0, which is choice C. So that's pretty tricky. Um, that's definitely something worth practicing over and over again to rethink about it from scratch. Three more problems. Oh, boy. This one's another strange one. These, pro these exams do have strange problems on them sometimes. Not your standard kind of problems. You want to test your problem solving skills within the context of calculus. Got a region in the plane that's bounded by a graph of a function y equals 1 over x. Looks about like this. The x axis is the, along the bottom. Vertical lines at x equals n and 4n. That's our plane region that we're thinking about. We're wondering about the area of this region as n changes. Does it increase as n increases, decreases as n increases, decreases for all n less than one fourth, or is it independent of n? As n increases, which makes this region move to the right with the left side moving more slowly than the right side, how does that area change as n changes? The area itself is the integral, because it's the area under a curve here, of this function 1 over x from n to 4n. So the key thing is to do that integral and then see how it depends on n. An antiderivative of natural uh, 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x, though we will not need absolute value signs because n is positive here. n is positive. We can get rid of them and get natural log of 4n minus natural log of n. So then you look at that function and say, boy, I wish I had my calculator and could figure out what the graph of that looks like. Yeah, I mean, you could plot some points. But what's better, what they want you to do is use a property of logarithms here. The difference of two logs is the log of the first thing divided by um, the second thing. 4n divided by n. And the n's cancel there and there. This is natural log of 4. The answer is independent of n. This area, it's pretty amazing. As n increases and the right line moves to the right four times as fast as the left line, the area stays constant. It's always equal to the natural log of 4. Pretty cool. All right, what do we have here? A limit problem. As x goes to infinity this time instead of some fixed number, Hmm. And it's, it's an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. So probably L'Hopital's rule will be needed. 
Do you have a guess as to what the answer is? Well, if the squaring wasn't there, if it was natural log of x divided by the square root of x, you should perhaps know from the past or remember that they both go to infinity, though slowly, but the natural log will go to infinity slower than the square root function will. This fraction will become, if, it, if the square were not there, this fraction will become smaller and smaller as x increases. But the squaring there complicates things. You probably have not been told, if you square a, a logarithm, does it still grow slower than the square root? The answer is yes, it will. But if we want to verify that, we need L'Hopital's rule. The answer is going to be A. But to verify that, we need L'Hopital's rule. It's not the quotient rule. We're not differentiating this fraction. We're differentiating the top and the bottom individually and putting them in a new, function, new fraction and saying the limits of these two things, if they exist, are equal. So take the derivative of the top, 2 natural log of x to the first power times the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. The derivative of the bottom is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. What kind of form is this? Well, it's good to simplify it next. Sometimes we have, might have to use L'Hopital's rule again, and I think this is the case where we will. 2 divided by 1 half is 2 times 2, which is 4. The L of x stays in the top. On the bottom, we're dividing by x there, and we're, we've got an x to the negative 1 half there. Um, just be careful here. We could multiply the top and the bottom by x if we want to be extra careful. Canceling that x there, and x times this will be x to the positive one half. Double check that. Yeah, that looks right. Hey, now we have a square root still in the bottom, and we have just a natural log to the first power. Yeah, the answer is going to be 0. But to be extra sure, we might want to use L'Hopital's rule again. It's still an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. Get 4 over x divided by 1 half, x to the negative 1 half, multiply the top and the bottom by x, and you get 4 over 2 square root of x. 2 and the 4 cancel, but you don't need to cancel them. This definitely goes to 0. 2 over something going to infinity definitely goes to 0. The answer is definitely 0. If you have enough intuition, you can answer the question without doing any work at all, really, but if you're uncertain about it, like most people would be, then you'd want to do that. Use local culture. All right, this last problem. Yay, I'm so excited. Hope you are too. Number 30, suppose f is a one-to-one -one differentiable function and a differentiable function g is its inverse. If f of 3 is 4 and f prime of 3 is 4 fifths, find g prime of 4. That doesn't sound so easy. Let's make a guess as to what the answer is. And then let's confirm the guess with, uh, with uh, calculations. You know that if you graph a function, an invertible function, and it's inverse with the same input variable x, say, in the same set of axes, and make the scales in the axes the same, that the graphs will be reflections across this diagonal line through the origin that goes at a 45 degree angle, y equals x. Now, I have no idea what the graph of f looks like, but I do know f of 3 is 4. And I do know f prime of 3 is 4 fifths. A line, it's going to be close to a line with a slope of 4 fifths near this point. The tangent line will have slope 4 fifths. A little less than 1. Since the inverse function has to be the reflection across this y equals x line of this graph, uh, careful, think about this carefully. Near the point for 3, right there, turn your head maybe at a 45 degree angle like this, the graph's got to look about like this. And the slope looks like it's bigger than 1 and positive. Rule out the negatives. Probably 5 fourths. That's probably the answer. And it is. Let's check it symbolically. There is a formula that can be memorized, but you can also derive it.
based on the knowledge that F and G are inverses, so if you plug one into the other, you get the original input back for all X in an appropriate domain. And assuming differentiability, you can then differentiate both sides with respect to X and use the chain rule on the left. Take the derivative of the outside function, plug in the inside function, times the derivative of the inside function. That's the derivative of the left side with using the chain rule. On the right, you differentiate with respect to X, you get 1. Now just solve this for G prime of X. I'm assuming G prime of X exists in doing this. It's not a proof of that fact, but let's go ahead and use it here. That's the formula we want to use. Sometimes the F inverse notation is used instead of G, and you should be able to use that if you need to. So G prime of what? Of 4 is 1 over F prime of G of 4. That's a 4 there. Hard to see. Uh, G of 4, though, equals 3. Because f of 3 equals 4, they flip. g of 4 equals 3. If 3, 4 is on the graph of f, then 4, 3 will be on the graph of its inverse. So this is 1 over f prime. g of 4 is 3. And again, that's a 4 in there. You can't see it, which you probably can. And we know f prime of 3 is 4 fifths. This is 1 over 4 fifths which is 5 fourths. A is the answer. That equals G prime of 4. Thanks for watching.